Daniel, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. I'm a curator now. I studied industrial design and worked in that area for a few years. Um, I've been teaching um, product design for about 20 years. Um, about 14 years of them in the MA in the Royal College of Arts. And, uh, in have sometimes don't need to teach when you have students like Dominic or Martino Gamper or Paul Coxedge. You just enjoy the conversation, and uh, you get to you have to gear up suddenly in the middle of an idea. And so that's my favorite thing: is coming across new ideas and figuring out what they mean. And Daniel, you've been involved in many of the most talked about things that have happened in, in design in the last few years. Um, exhibitions, publications, and so on and so forth. I mean, tell us about this, for example, the Power of Making. Well, Power of Making, which is a joint exhibition of the v &A and the Craft Council in the contemporary space in the v and um, set out to discuss uh, issues of craft. But uh, looking at the two institutes involved, I went back to their original mission statements and I found one sentence that was joined to both of them which is to inspire future makers and so I concentrated on making and the reaction was amazing it, it was overwhelming really we had 320,000 visitors it's been the most uh, popular exhibition ever free exhibition ever at the V&A and the question is really why is it just a, a uh, kind of uh, the subject or are we at a very special time in relation to making so what is going on? Why talk about craft in an era of digital technology, of mass fabrication, of, mm. of rapid prototyping? What, what's the relevance of craft? Well, craft is everywhere. You know, we, anyone involved in industry knows that people and craft and knowledge and skills are in every layer. They've not disappeared, they've just less known. Um, but on the other hand, we are in an era where people don't know so much about the things. We don't know about the things we use. We don't know how to fix them. We don't know where they're made, the materials, and so our instinct is to, if something's broken or if something uh, is not working, even if it's not broken, we'll go and replace it instead of think how to fix it. So my interest was to remind people that most of us, in, in fact, uh, almost all of us, can make. And it's kind of somewhere stuck somewhere in, in our cupboard, and we just forgot about it. So this exhibition was really just opening this cupboard and reminding everyone that uh, uh, making is amazing, and it's free. It's fun when you get in the zone of making, anyone that's done it. Um, but also, making at the highest level is producing new knowledge, and craft is that knowledge that and the the skills they they're not owned by anyone but each time someone gets really good at something and pushes things along it's a fascinating area of discussion and we have to move on to the next yep. image now yep. so yeah we're in uh, jalalabad this is the fab lab in jalalabad where these kids made their first chess set it's the first time they used a laser cutter Fab Labs is an amazing uh, shift in the way that people will have access to technology. There are over 100, probably around 130 Fab Labs. These are fabrication labs. They started at MIT. And the idea here is kind of to leapfrog straight into uh, use of technology. So people that have not had access, to get access to laser cutter, 3D printers, knitting, whatever you, you need in order to carry out your idea. And this is going to change libraries. If you can think about what the future of libraries is going to be, it's going to be a hub of computers. It's not going to be books anymore. You're going to be downloading data. You're going to be printing print-on-demand books if you want to hold the thing, but you're going to be printing objects. So libraries, education, fabrication, all the services that you need, you know, a plumber or maybe um, the example that we are trying to do here in the Great Recovery, if you go visit the stand, that is looking at the circular economy. We have a 3D printer there printing little bits of objects that have been broken. So we just printed the back of this remote control, which didn't have a back and was about to go to landfill. The guys there just looked at it, sketched it up, printed it. This is like 10 minutes and it's back in circulation. So these are the things that I think a lot of, a lot of these examples are going to surface. We've been talking about it. It's like sustainability. There were about 10 years that it was talked about. And now we are seeing actual projects and applications and smart houses and transition cities. And it's, a, it's an era of doing.
for sustainability. The same is going to happen with this digital technology. It's very strange that you should show this because we <laughs> lost the back of our remote oh. last week. I don't know what the kids did with it. Yeah. But we've ha absolutely had that dilemma because every time the kids use the TV, the batteries fall out. So we're thinking, well, do we have to throw this remote away? Do we have to get in touch with Virgin and get another one? Yeah. Um, if there was somewhere where we could go locally, like oh, a, the, you, will, the you will download the data and print it, and you might even improve it so you, it won't get lost again, you know. And then you'll put the improvement back on, and other people will use it. Of course, another aspect of this is there's clearly something wrong with remote control design that the yes. backs keep falling off and getting lost. Exactly, and that's the next step. In fact, we've just launched a small project. Uh, it's called Fixbits, and it's all about finding people who are really good at making and putting them in touch with people that need something fixed, but something that is a bit important to their day-to-day. -day. They come into someone's house, they f see if they're using their wheelchair in a way that's challenging, or their fridge is too low, or the lights don't work, and they try and understand the, the behavior of the person in the way that a designer would do, and fix it with materials which are low cost in an ingenious way. And this is what Fixbits is about. And we, we want to get a lot of Fixbits, meeting a lot of fixed partners, and making a lot of these fixed films. And then use them to, in a way, teach design through fixing. Bruce Sterling wrote about this really well. And he sees the future of making as hacking the post-industrial milieu. It's going to be messy. It's going to be craft, and it's going to be industry. Thanks so much, Daniel. Thank it's you for inviting really me. It's been really interesting conversation.